Frederick Douglass, he was one of the great Americans in our nation's history. In spite of the fact that his own nation had him enslaved up into adulthood, he escaped. And he became one of the great social reformers, abolitionists, orators, writers, and statesmen. Frederick Douglass knew how to flourish in the face of trials and opposition. For instance, as a little boy, he was unable to read, and it was illegal for him to be taught as a little boy in slavery to read. In an article about Douglas in the World News Daily, it is explained that while he was illiterate as a child and unable to read, his master's wife began to teach him. She saw a deep yearning to learn in him, and she began to teach him to read till his master discovered it and forbid her from teaching him. Later, Douglas learned that he was able to get bread from the pantry of the plantation on which he was enslaved. And out in the community, there were some young boys his age who were white, but who were poor. And he discovered that if he carried bread with him and a book, he could talk them into telling him what the words meant and said if he gave them bread. And so it was that way that he learned to read. Frederick Douglass understood overcoming trials and opposition in order to flourish. And I believe certainly his intelligence, certainly his craftiness, his intangible leadership abilities were part of him flourishing. But I contend to you, I believe that his flourishing in the face of opposition and trial was more than his ingenuity. In the life and times of Frederick Douglass, one of the last biographies written about him he was quoted as sharing his own personal salvation testimony. And he said, I was not more than 13 years old, I'm quoting now, when my loneliness and destitution, I longed for someone to whom I could go as a father and a protector. The preaching of a white Methodist minister named Hanson was the means of causing me to feel that in God I had such a friend. He thought that all men, great and small, bond and free, were sinners in the sight of God, and that they were by nature rebels against His government, and that they must repent of their sins and be reconciled to God through Christ. I cannot say that I had a very distinct notion of what was required of me, but one thing I did know well, I was wretched. <laughs> And had no means of making myself otherwise. Pause for a second. The first step in getting someone saved is what some of the old timers used to say is getting them lost. <laughs> when a person comes to a realization of his or her lostness, he is in a good position to begin to understand what it means to be saved. If you are here today and you've never before discovered that it is your sin that keeps you from salvation and eternal life and there's nothing you can do to overcome it, that's not such a bad place to be because the next step is, Pastor, how can I overcome my sin? Why, uh, uh, Douglas went on to say, I consulted a good old colored man named Charles Lawson, and in tones of holy affection, he told me to pray and to cast all my care upon God. This I sought to do, and though for weeks I was a poor, broken-hearted mourner, traveling through doubts and fears, I finally found my burden lightened and my heart relieved. I loved all mankind, slaveholders not accepted, though I abhorred slavery more than ever at that point. I saw the world in a new light, and my great concern was to have everybody converted. My desire to learn increased, and especially did I want a thorough acquaintance with the contents of of the Bible. I cannot imagine a situation of greater hopelessness than to have been enslaved. 
to have been a young slave watching your parents and grandparents, generations been there, thinking in your mind that because they have been and because you're, it's a generational thing, you will never escape. In addition, many of the slaveholders in that day used Scripture to defend slavery. I cannot defend that. I cannot explain it. I do not understand it. But it was what it was. And yet, Frederick Douglass, through Jesus Christ, found the great power to walk in victory and release in the face of enormous opposition. This is why I believe him to be a great American. Not because of his politics and not because of his social conscience, but because of the fact that he was a born-again man who allowed that to use him to rise in victory. Ladies and gentlemen, God enables Christians to walk through trials and opposition. He did it for Frederick Douglass in the days past. He's done it for many of you. He still does that through us today. And as we come upon Acts chapter 12... We're going to consider some of the distinctive characteristics of Christians to be able to display victory while walking through trials and opposition. We are in Acts chapter 12. Walking through trials and opposition. Acts chapter 12. We have come upon the place in the book of Acts where we are nearing the end of the ministry of Peter. In fact, this chapter 12... We'll talk about Peter a lot, but after that, he's only mentioned one more time in chapter 15. By the time we reach Acts chapter 13, it's all about the ministry of Paul. Paul kind of becomes the, the leader of the international church, if you will. But here in Acts chapter 12, we come up on a situation where a leader, a political leader sent by Rome, found that he gained great applause and great support from the Jewish leaders of the time when he attacked Christians. He found it to be politically expedient to attack Christians, not that he was such a, a great follower of Judaism himself, but he was a man who liked acclaim and he was a man who liked all the polls to, to read in his favor. So whatever it would require... Herod Agrippa would do that. There are several Herods in the Scriptures, and it can get a little confusing. There was the Herod that killed all the little babies, thinking he could get rid of Jesus. And there was uh, a Herod. There are actually three Herods mentioned uh, in the New Testament era. This is Herod Agrippa. He is in power now, and he was the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod Agrippa was a man whose family in the past was half Jewish. And so he used that as he ruled in Palestine and in Israel. He used that to his favor. And so as we pick up in Acts chapter 12, we see some uh, trials. We see some opposition come against Peter and the Christians simply because they were Christians. And yet we see some characteristics of these Christians that, by the way, will be true of you too. If you're walking in Christ and you're walking through trials, these same characteristics can be true of you today if you know Christ as your Savior. And if you're here today without Christ, let me suggest that if you're lost and walking through trials, that trial is just a trial. But if you're saved and walking through trials, it can be used for eternal purposes and to the glory of God and for victorious living in your life. Beginning in chapter 12, verse 1, let's see some of these characteristics that should be true of you. Verse 1, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And so he tested the waters in verse 2, then he killed James the brother of John with the sword. Let's be very specific about who this James is. There are a couple of different Jameses in the New Testament. This is the James whose brother was John, who Jesus called the sons of thunder. If you'll recall, there was a point where some of the Jews were doing things, and James and John said to Jesus, Master, should we call down lightning and thunder on their heads? And Jesus making fun of them, really began to call them the sons of thunder. These are the brothers whose mama showed up to Jesus. You know, mamas love their little boys. 
And sometimes, if you're not careful, you can go a little far. And so James and John's mama showed up and said, Jesus, my little boys are following you, and I want to know that when you're in the kingdom, they will sit at your right and your left hand. Mom, it's like mama's showing up at the ball field. Coach, I want my son to start. He's the best one out here. And that coach is going, law help, ma'am. He's terrible. <laughs> coach, I want my son to hit second in the lineup and play shortstop. Coach, I want my son to start at point guard. That, that's what's happening here. And Jesus says, ma'am, you have no idea what you're asking. The reality is, I don't even have a say-so on this, only my Father in heaven, right? That is the James we're talking about. So you can imagine, James was probably one who was a bit outspoken. Now, Peter was the most outspoken, but James, he was that. And James was one of the great leaders of the church. And so Herod yanked him up and killed him. And look at what happens in verse 3. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, his approval ratings among the Jewish citizens Shot up, spiked up. All the, the Reuters and all the, the, the people who take all the polls, they took the polls after he killed James. Wow, his popularity has really shot up. The little thing that scrolls across the bottom of the screen that tells you the news, Herod Agrippa's popularity has spiked 33 points since the killing of James. <laughs> and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also, make Make this note, his intent was to kill Peter. Heck, if killing James got me popular, imagine if I killed their leader. Except, it says, it was during the days of unleavened bread. This would be um, those days immediately after the Passover. Some of you may recall that Jesus was crucified during that time period. And so it is somewhat ironic that now, the leader of the church, Peter, is arrested and is intended, it's intended that he would be executed under Herod Agrippa. Except it's the days of the, the uh, unleavened bread just after the Passover, so people are really focused on this type of worship and being in their homes, and they're not out and about. But as those days of unleavened bread end, there will still be a lot of people in town. There will still be big crowds. They won't be focused on the Passover celebration and the unleavened bread observance. And so there will be plenty of crowd appeal. I would imagine that Herod consulted with his advisors. When is the most strategic time to kill Peter? Well, let's wait until the days of unleavened bread are done. All the people will still be in town. The crowds will still be here. They won't be so focused on the events of the Passover and the unleavened bread days. And boy, you'll get a lot of bang for your buck on that one, Herod. So he intends to kill Peter at that end. Verse 4, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him. Each squad had four soldiers in it. So basically 16 soldiers were put there to observe Peter. You remember the last time Peter and John got arrested. It's a funny scene. They arrested them. Their religious leaders put them in jail. In the middle of the night, an angel walked them out. The next morning, the council reconvened. Go get Peter and John. Guy runs to go get Peter and John. Runs back and says, I don't know where they are. And they go, where are they? Another guy all of a sudden runs in. They're in the middle of the temple preaching. And so this happened before Herod Agrippa wanted to make sure that could not happen. And so he put 16 soldiers in rotations every four hours overseeing Peter. It's like he's some kind of public enemy number one. <laughs> and so the soldiers were there to keep him, verse 4, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Think, something I see interesting here is that James was killed and for all outward indications, that did not stop Peter from preaching because if it had, he never would have been arrested. If Peter had backed off and stopped, and yet he continued on. And so this brings me to my first thought about Christians who are facing opposition, Christians who are facing trials. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. In the midst of trials and opposition in some of the most difficult points of our lives, sometimes our tendency is to back off 
of walking in our faith. And yet the scriptures seem to indicate something very different. They seem to indicate that when the trials were on and the opposition ramped up, the preachers turned up the heat. <laughs> and so there is the perseverance of preaching in the midst of trials and opposition. Now, I'm not saying you need to step up in a pulpit in the front of Green Acres Baptist Church on Sunday morning to preach. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. In fact, the vast majority of Christians aren't quote-unquote pastors, preachers. The vast majority of Christians are accountants and teachers and engineers and, and uh, inventory clerks and physicians and attorneys and mechanics but wherever you are, wherever you work, wherever you go to school, whatever community in which you live, there is your opportunity to communicate the gospel preaching of sorts. And when trials and opposition come, please do not allow the enemy to convince you that that's the time where you need to back off. What we see in the scriptures is that when trials and opposition came, the preachers persevered. <laughs> I think of one persevering preacher, that was Noah. If you, if you look all the way through the scriptures and all the, the, the verses that deal with uh, when he built the ark and how long it took, we, we have come to the discovery that it took about 120 years, according to the author of Hebrews, it took about 120 years to build the ark. Peter, in his second letter, 2 Peter, Peter claims that all the while that Noah was building, he preached. So if you take Hebrews that said it took him 120 years to build the ark, and if you take 2 Peter that says while he built it, he preached, apparently Peter pre uh, Noah preached 120 years as he built the ark. i got to tell you, that's perseverance. People to come, Noah, what you're building, an ark? What's that? Well, it's a boat. What's a boat? Well, it floats on water. After it rains, what's rain? It had never rained before. And for 120 years, he had people, I'm sure, deriding him and scoffing at him and making fun of him. And all the while, he's going to look, you all need to repent. I'm telling you, you're going to want to get inside this boat once it starts raining. I'm telling you, no, we don't even know what rain is. What is rain? Well, all this water is going to fall from the sky to such a degree that it's going to create like a, a huge lake everywhere you see land. Right, Noah. <laughs> right. And for 120 years, he preached. What we see throughout the scriptures Time and time again, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Malachi and Zechariah and Amos, John the Baptist, the apostles, the apostle Paul, Peter, all of them, time and time again, when the heat was turned up, they did not back down in sharing the gospel. And so, ladies and gentlemen, one of the ways that it seems that we persevere through trials is we continue to be prepared to share our faith in spite of it. Look at verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but they assembled a, 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 a group that would march out front of the prison with signs that say, free Peter, right? They organized a protest. They called their local attorney. They, no. <laughs> they started praying. Prayer was offered to God for him by the church. This is their leader. And you strike down the shepherd and the sheep scatter. I'm sure that was Herod's intent. And can you imagine how discouraged God's people must have been? Just suppose that the leadership in this church, not, not just anybody, not just a deranged gunman, but the government. We're not talking about a deranged govern, uh, gunman. What if the mayor of this city, the police chief, burst in here one day and took the leaders from and put them in jail and prepared to execute us? I think it's an understatement to say that might be a little discouraging. And so what would you do? Verse 6, and when Herod was about to bring him out that night, I love this, do not uh, underestimate this statement. That night, what was Peter doing? Oh, Lord, please save me, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, please save me. Is that what Peter was doing? That dude was sleeping. The night before Jesus died, if you'll recall, Jesus told him to stay awake. And he slept because he was exhausted. Peter slept that first time from exhaustion he sleeps this time because of perfect contentment. 
You're going to die tomorrow. I'm going to take you out. You're going to be executed. Pastor, I have enough trouble sleeping as it is. You know, maybe, I, I, I'm not listening. I know there are physiological things that keep us from sleeping. But sometimes, listen to me, with all the love in my heart, I say sometimes we don't sleep because we aren't nearly as peaceful in Christ as Peter was. I'm not saying every time, and I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes I fear. I just couldn't sleep because I was so worried. Well, do you think your worry is going to add to God's sovereignty? Do you think your worry is someone how going to make God stronger, more omnipotent than he already is? You know, omnipotent means all power. It's, you can't be more powerful than that. And so Peter's laying here in the jail. And can you imagine? And it says here in just a moment, he's chained to two soldiers. I can't possibly imagine a more uncomfortable place to sleep. I mean, I got a, I got a nice mattress. We, we, most of us got nice mattresses. Sometimes something's going on tomorrow, a, a test that we've got to have run or, or something we're concerned about, and we can't sleep. Now, I will say this. God is the one that the scriptures say God gives us sleep. God's the one that gives us sleep. He gave Peter good sleep. And so when Herod again, verse 6, when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side. This, this word struck is no, no gentle nudge. How many of you, it, it's hard to wake you up. I mean, if a hurricane came and blew your house down, you might sleep right through it. That's Peter. <laughs> Peter is sleeping so good, this angel's got to go, Peter, get up! <laughs> he struck him on the side. <laughs> That dude's sleeping. <laughs> what is it? REM sleep, rapid eye movement. He's rapid eye movement times two. <laughs> and a light shone in the prison. He struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. So something supernatural is happening. Verse 8, then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie your sandals. So he did it. <laughs> he he, he kind of had his... His, uh, his whole robe untied and his shoes were off and he was comfortable just, just snoozing. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment so there's an outer cloak that Peter had taken off. You know how it is you get ready for bed? I mean, Peter was like, I'm going to sleep tonight. <laughs> Ain't no need to worry about it. If I die tomorrow, I do, but I'm going to sleep. I'm going to be a well-rested, executed man. So he went out, verse 9, and followed him and did not know, I love this, did not know what was done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. Peter thought he was still asleep. <laughs> he thought he was dreaming. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. So supernaturally, the, the chains fell off his hands. Those guards must be asleep. He left out. Somehow, someway, supernaturally, God made it to where they didn't notice what was happening whether God made him invisible or did like a, a Star Trek beam me up Scotty kind of deal, I don't know. I just know that he was able to walk past a couple of guards and go right out and they never saw him. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And it wasn't until then, verse 11, that Peter had come to himself. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. No, no kidding. <laughs> the Bible, the master of the understatement, right? And has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Watch this, folks. When a Christian is facing trials and opposition, not only is there going to be the sign of the perseverance of preaching, the perseverance of continuing to testify, but there is also going to be the sign of the presence of peace. The presence of peace. That is exactly what was happening with Peter. How many of you know the presence of peace does not necessarily indicate the presence of peaceful circumstances? Oftentimes we tend to ask God to make our circumstances more peaceful. One of the things I'm learning as I pray for many of you, you know what I'm praying? God, make him or her walk in peace. Whatever happens on the outside. God, if you don't choose to cure the disease, if you don't choose to stop the cancer, give them peace. Because 
I know that physically they're, they're biologically not in a peaceful situation. Uh, God, if, 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 they're, if they're facing a, <clears throat> a deal with their job or their finances or, or their friendships and it's chaos around them and it seems very difficult, the first thing I tend to pray anymore is for the person to grow in peace, even if the circumstances don't change. Nothing wrong with asking God, God, take these circumstances away like Jesus prayed, but yet, Lord, uh, I want your will to be done, so whatever happens, I pray, Lord, that I would walk in peace. I got a question for you. If your Christianity only gives you peace in good circumstances, why in the world would a lost person want what you have? If when circumstances fall down around you, you fall apart, why does a lost person need that? They can do that without Jesus. <laughs> they can do that without the Lord. But God, help us that we would be a people when we're facing trials, when we're facing opposition, when we're facing things we never could have thought possible. Some of you this past year in 2017, you faced things that it never occurred to you could possibly happen. It, you never thought about it. And there are going to be some of us in 2018, we're going to face things that we couldn't possibly know now how challenging they are going to be. And I've got to ask the question, are we going to see this distinctive, the presence of peace? You've you got to get prepared before crazy circumstances happen. But if we fall apart every time unpeaceful circumstances hit, then why is that any different than what lost people do? Prepare yourself before the unpeaceful circumstances hit. Load your gun before the battle starts. The presence of peace. And then I have two verses I want to look at kind of separately. Verse 5 and then <clears throat> verse 12. Verse 5, remember it says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And then verse 12, so when he had considered this, that is Peter's out, he's beyond, he realizes that, that uh, he's been released. When he realized that God had released him, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark where many were gathered together praying. This would be the same Mark who Paul would get hacked off at because he uh, abandoned the mission trip, but by the end of Paul's ministry, John Mark would make a comeback. This would be at his house. And they were gathered there. We can assume that it was a fairly large house, so somehow, some way, John Mark's mother was uh, fairly well off. She had a large enough house where all the Christians could gather, and what were they doing? They we're gathered together praying. Watch this, folks. Here's another distinctive of a Christian who is facing trial and opposition. Here's another distinctive. The persistence in prayer. The persistence in prayer. In verse 5, it says, they began to pray. This is after James was murdered and Peter was arrested. I don't know about you, <clears throat> But let me go back to that illustration. Suppose the, the, the mayor and the uh, police chief for the city of Warner Robins came in one Sunday morning and arrested Pastor Mike and I, and they killed one of us, and the other they planned to kill later. Would this church be prepared to say, we need to gather and we need to pour our hearts out to God and pray? Or would there be a scattering? Would there be chaos going on? What would be happening in those times? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> Christians who, who walk victoriously through opposition, one of the characteristics you see of them is persistence in prayer. <laughs> Already earlier in the book of Acts, Peter and John were arrested. And when Peter and John were released, they went to the house where the, all the Christians were gathered and they all prayed together. We see it time and time and time again. When Jesus was facing the greatest crisis of his life, he had to pray. It wasn't that, well, I've got to make time to pray. It's that I can't not pray. There is one characteristic that seems to come up over and over and over again amidst the Christians and, and the, the followers of God. All through the Scriptures is a persistence in prayer. And, and you remember when Jesus was crucified? And old Peter and the disciples, they were waiting and waiting and they really didn't know what was going on. And Peter went off and was preparing himself and decided he was just going to go back to fishing. This discipling thing isn't working out. I'm just going to go back to fishing. And if you'll recall, he went out on the, the boat and he and the disciples were out in the boat all night and didn't catch anything. 
Come mourning some guys on the shore. Hey, Peter, throw your net out on the left side. Peter's going, yeah, like we hadn't done that all night. <laughs> Thanks a lot, dude. <laughs> and they do, and they catch all the fish. The one thing that, that I, I notice in that is that they weren't busy praying. Remember in the garden what Jesus told them? <laughs> you pray, you're going to need it. And it was at that time they learned, you know what, when, when trials hit, when opposition hits, we need to be praying because when Jesus was ascended to the Father and left the apostles all by themselves, you know what they did? They got with 120, went into an upper room in Jerusalem, and they waited. And while they waited, you know what they did? They prayed. At the end of chapter 12, by the way, we're going to see in the next few weeks in chapter 13 that Paul and, and some of the leaders in the church in Antioch, there was persecution beginning to happen in the church and things were getting difficult. But according to the first two or three verses of 13, Paul and the leaders in that church, they were praying. One of the characteristics of a Christian who's walking in victory and trial and opposition is a persistence in prayer. And I just wonder, is that you? Is that me? When tough times hit, what is my response? Ladies and gentlemen, God enables Christians to be able to walk in victory in the face of trial and opposition. It's what makes, it's one of the things that makes us so distinct as a people. It's one of the things that makes the kind of the, the nation of Christianity. I'm not talking about America, I'm not talking about Germany, I'm not talking about England, I'm talking about the church. One of the things that makes the church so distinctive, so different, is the way we respond to trials and opposition. If you venture to other parts of the world outside of the United States, some of you know, you will see things very foreign to your own world. You will see distinctive marks to other cultures. Some other countries aren't ruled by the same types of etiquette or protocol that we are in America. There are places in the Middle East where there are high concentrations of Muslims where you'll see the women, everything's covered but their eyes. We see that on TV sometimes and if you go there, that's distinctive to their culture. There, there are certain areas in Central and South America in, in Latino areas where um, our, our insistence on being on time isn't as much of an insistence in those areas. And sometimes being an hour late for a meeting is not really late at all. It's just a different way of operating. In some of the countries of the Far East, especially Southeast Asia and Korea, there are dishes that they eat which are foreign to us. In fact, some of them are illegal in America. Grilled dog or cat or monkey. It's a little different, a little distinctive, isn't it? There is a, a nation in this world that is distinctive from any other nation on the face of the earth. That nation is the people of God through Jesus Christ. Christians offer forgiveness no matter what when people don't deserve it. Christians exhibit peace, patience, and joy in a world that doesn't have any of it. Christians consider themselves last instead of looking out for number one. That is distinctive to the Christian nation. Christians also have the resource and the power given us by Christ to flourish during trials. And that is distinctive. Ladies and gentlemen, my prayer, as we kind of pause here today, we'll pick up this passage down the road. But there's so much here. I didn't want to cover it all on one Sunday. I wanted to spend two weeks covering the victory that Christians can have in the face of trial and opposition. Because I suspect this is where we live. So I'm asking you, do you know Christ as your Savior? If you do, he's giving you the, He has given you the resources to walk in victory. But if you are here today without a certainty of salvation, 
Could I suggest today that this is what you do? In a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward. You come down and say, Pastor, I'd like to talk with someone about how to know Christ as my Savior for certain. Christians, maybe you're praying right now, Lord, if there's anybody in here who's lost or uncertain of salvation, I pray that today would be their day. And it is in Christ that you can begin to operate in this, to appropriate this power and these truths. But first, you've got to know Christ. You've got to be born again. You've got to know Christ as your Savior. Or maybe it is that, Christians, you have faced something this week. You are beginning to face something in the coming days. And you just want to get on your face before the Lord and pray, God, help me to walk with that victorious display that would show people Jesus Christ. Some of you have faced things in the last months that, quite frankly, would cripple most people. But I'm saying God is giving you the power to walk in victory. Maybe you, you, God's just leading you to come and be a part of this fellowship. The pastor, could you tell me how I can become a part of this church? I will explain it. And we can't wait to see how God will use you here if he's drawing you to this place. I'm going to pray, and you're going to stand, and then you respond as the Lord leads. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, help us to respond in obedience to your word right now. You stand. As the Lord speaks, you stand. As the Lord speaks to your heart, you respond.